Thanks for coming to VegFest. Hope you're having a lovely um, day or weekend for everybody that's been here all day yesterday and today. Um, I'm Karen from Veggie Vision TV and we're media partners and best friends with VegFest. And um, I do my very best to address the fact that we feel that veganism should be on TV. And we do that in a humble way by running Veggie Vision TV. And we've got some really big plans and great ideas. So please go to veggievision.tv or Facebook or Twitter and we've just started up Instagram as well. And please share us, uh, you know, and send us some love because we love to hear from everybody. And, um, yeah, I, I love the VegFest. Been around for many, many years. Look after the publicity for VegFest and the celebrities. So if you've seen some celebrities wandering around, we had quite a few yesterday, including Peter Egan, wonderful actor, Jasmine Harmon from A Place in the Sun, um, Benjamin Zephaniah should be wandering around, and about 50 journalists. So it's wonderful to feel that, um, you know, they're getting a nice vegan experience. Um, and, yeah, I've been having a lovely chat um, with our lovely next speaker um, from Brazil and has travelled in all the way from New York, New York. We had to say it twice, didn't we, earlier? And um, she seems a really cool lady. I love the fact that instantaneously when she found out about veganism, she had to be vegan. And not only that, she started campaigning straight away. So I feel we need to give her some much love. And I'm going to try to say this in her beautiful accent, which I'm going to get wrong. Raffaella Chiavatta. I hope I've done that some justice with my Essex accent. But please, can we really be loud? Because I love to have the loudest room at VegFest and give a warm welcome to this beautiful lady who's going to give us an incredible talk. Thank you. How are y'all doing? Good? I'm sorry for the technical difficulties and for sticking around. If you do want to leave, though, there's Brenda Sanders or another talk, my friend, so I won't be offended if you do leave and go see her talk, you know. So it is such an honor and it's completely terrifying to be here, but I'm going to roll with you all. Uh, and I wanted to um, thank the organizers for taking into consideration things like accessibility for folks like me who may not have the monetary access to come all the way to here. So I want to thank the organizer of VegFest for taking that into consideration in this um, and making it accessible for me. So before we dive in, I'd like to give you a quick background about what we are going to be talking about and some trigger warnings. So we'll be discussing you know, issues of homophobia, xenophobia, racism, sexism, and ageism. And there will be some images that may be you know, troubling, a little violent. I don't, I don't usually put too much graphic, but there may be some images of violence in there. So you know, um, I first started doing activism for queer liberation since I pretty much came out of the closet at age 13. You know, that's like super premature, but you know, I knew I was, I knew I was gay. Uh, and it wasn't until my late 20s that I got involved into animal rights and started learning more in depth about the history of other social justice movements and the relationship among struggles. So I am here to talk about the work we do at Collectively Free through a queer immigration lens and a holistic view of what activism could look like, providing case studies and tips for activism. So one struggle, one fight, how to fight for humans and animal rights. So, you know, whenever you, you have a project, right, um, whatever that project may be, say you're putting together a business or a conference or an action, it's always helpful to look at the past and present to learn a few things from them so that we can avoid falling into the same pitfalls. So the pitfalls I want to focus for this, this talk are going to be part one, uh, lack of inclusivity and oppressive behaviors, uh, especially in the animal rights movement. Uh, part two, uh, the lack of pro intersectionality. And part three, solidarity with other movements and lack of building bridges with those movement, movements. And I'll explain why I think these three points are very important for us as animal rights activists to be aware of, right? So let's look at the past and the present of a few movements and consider a few, a few of the issues that could have been handled differently. Right? Let's start with, the, for example, the Indian independence movement, having in mind those three things that we talked about. Right? So Gandhi, for example, included no women in his original group of seven Satyagraha, and that, of course, created a deep resentment right, from female freedom fight fighters who put their bodies in line. And there's also a side note, and you can do some more research on this, but he was also um, a racist, so you know, that, those are things we need to consider when we are analyzing other movements. 
Let's talk about the civil rights movement, for example, which was mostly male dominant, um, and the feminist movement, which was mostly white dominant, right? And led black feminists to cre actually create the theory of intersectionality, which was specifically created to analyze how race and gender intersected. And of course, let's not forget how the white cis men took all the credits for the Stonewall riot, riots when it was actually you know, trans women of color who were, were leading the riots. Or the animal rights movement uh, who likes to impose its whiteness and push away people of color still like to pretend that animal rights is an inven invention of the white. Erasing such important groups like MOVE, and if you were at Christopher Sebastian's talk, he talked about MOVE, but if you don't know who they are, highly recommend you do some research on them. Um, you know, so we have all this, we have such an important movement um, created by MOVE that was completely erased from animal rights history. So, why are issues like inclusivity and oppressive behavior so important? Because exclusions of minority from any movement based on the sole fact that they are a minority is replicating similar patterns of violence from the oppressors that we're actually trying to fight against. So we become the police, we become the multi-millionaire farmer, uh, and we become the colonizer when we adopt such postures, right? So when we do activism, uh, we need to consider uh, what, what we are doing exactly to support and help minorities. You know, I'm giving you a context, for example, in the United States. Blacks are less than 13% 30, uh, of the population, and yet they are 31% of all fatal police shooting victims. And 39% of those killed by the police weren't attacking. And why should that be important to us? Because when we're doing activism, we have to be aware of minorities doing those activisms. We may not think about it because, you know, you may look like me, who's a white person and gets a lot of white privilege, and totally forget that, you know, your activist, fellow activist who's a person of color is subject to those st statistics, right? Undocumented immigrants, did I put the slides here? Mm, no, okay. Undocumented immigrants, for example, you know, who do activisms, uh, activism can be deported when they are detained. And if you're a green card holder, and I'm talking about, you know, US, because that's what I'm basing my talk about, you're not in much a better position either because you can too be deported. That having a green card does not exclude you from being deported. And if you're lucky, you know, say um, they're not gonna deport you, you're gonna have a criminal history which can uh, prevent you from getting citizenship, which happens a lot. So, you know, maybe those are things we aren't thinking about when we're doing our activism and protests and we think everybody's just treated the same, right? And if we really want to dig a little bit deeper, let's combine all those situations, right, with people who suffer multiple types of oppression, like, say, black trans women who can be sent to male prisons on top of experiencing, you know, transphobia, also have to deal with racism, sexual assault, and unnecessary solitary confinement. Immigrants with disabilities, they're completely often forgotten. And if you add low income to all this equation, you know, yeah, classism is a big also factor in, de in determining who's eligible and who's not eligible for doing activism because bail is only possible for those people who have monetary gain. You know, so I know it's a lot of things to digest, but just, you know, stay with me so we'll do this together. So what is this thing, right? Privilege. Oh, I, I, I do want to talk about this replicating violence thing. So that was me being almost arrested at uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. We did a disruption at St. Patrick's Cathedral during Easter. Um, yeah, and that was, that was pretty bad. Because at the time I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the, the green card. Um, so it's privilege, you know, sounds like a really awful thing, but it, it doesn't have to be. You know, so going back to the St. Patrick's Cathedral, um, during the last two years as an animal rights activist, I've been pretty much constantly pressured to take high-risk actions, and even after repeatedly explaining my sensitive immigration status, like I mentioned, I didn't have the green card, I just recently got the green card. Um, you know, even, even after explaining that, I was just completely trampled on. And in this action, actually a lawyer misinformed us about uh, the legal repercussions involved. Um, and I was putting also in a position of taking the lead in case the leader uh, was arrested, which actually happened. <laughs> so I was you know, being handcuffed with other six um, uh, activists at the time. And I just wanna put out there that you know, I immigrated 
on to the U.S. through a political asylum petition, which is ba was based on sexual orientation for persecution of being gay in Brazil. So you know, like when you when you combine all these things, and you never know who your activists are, they can be going through some deep life-threatening danger. You know, because being sent back to Brazil would mean that I could possibly, you know, face persecution again. So, you know, but a good display of privilege in this case was that my good friend, oh, and you know, I put this slide here just to remind people to be friendly to immigrants. <laughs> Very subtle. So, you know, a good display of privilege in this case was that my good friend Jacob, who is, you know, a white man, sits in straight, able-bodied, middle-class man, took the lead in the St. Patrick's disruption. Um, you know, Jacob is a man, so he enjoys the perks of patriarchy, right? Like being significantly less likely to suffer violence and sexual abuse in, pr in prison or jail. Jacob is also white, so he's five times less likely to go to jail or prison when compared to a black man. He's also a citizen, so he can't be deported, right? Jacob is also straight. Um, and why would I even bring up Jacob's sexual orientation in this game? Well, you know, I didn't mention before, but when I was being handcuffed at the St. Patrick's Cathedral disruption, the police kept uh, referring me to as, a, as sir, sir, you know? So obviously, he was making sure to let me know that things weren't looking good for me, you know, that, that definitely my sexual orientation played a role in there, and it really does, because Amnesty reports that lesbians and other women who are seen to transgress gender boundaries are often at higher risks of torture and ill treatment, and that perceived or actual sexual orientation is one of the four categories that make a female prisoner more likely a target of sexual abuse. You know, and maybe, maybe we don't think about these things, right? So once you start adding age, and then you start adding, adding class and ability, things even start getting even more complex, right? So it's very important that we get in the habit of learning more about different forms of oppression, also because of legitimate reasons of community safety for our fellow activists, right? Poli uh, practice a little sort of like daily privilege check, you know, ask yourself some sort of like uncomfortable questions. So if you're a white looking woman like myself, ask yourself, you know, can I walk around without being unnecessarily stopped by, by the police? Yeah, you know, but, you know, can I, can I walk around and not be catcalled even if I'm wearing my pajamas? No, that happens pretty often. So, you know, like, just ask yourself really comfortable, uncomfortable questions. So, of course, uh, no one wants to become the oppressor, right, or the police or that multimillion uh, dollar farmer that we, that we talked about. So we have to resist the urge to let our privilege speak higher and brush off people's experiences and struggles just because an action was successful, right? So what are minorities supposed to do then? Are we gonna just sit down and not do any disruptions or high-risk actions and watch the more privileged folks take over? Absolutely not, because as we've seen, that was the problem in the beginning, right, when we analyzed past um, movements. On the contrary, I think personally disruptions and high-risk actions, direct action, are extremely empower empowering to minorities precisely because they're already socially disadvantaged. You know, so when minorities take the lead and they disrupt speciesism, they can also challenge other forms of oppression like patriarchy, you know, and white supremacy and heteronormativity, which are also necessary layers to dismantle um, speciesism and to give free, uh, the animals the freedom that they deserve. And I'll explain more why dismantling different forms of oppression are also more important on part, on part three besides of those reasons I already mentioned. So where can we start? Let's move from just creating a safe space for activists to creating a brave space. And this is not my term. I forget who invented this term, but you know, I'm just quoting, uh, I think it was like a social justice um, circles, that term circulates a lot. So I apologize if I don't remember who, who did that. So initiate the conversation, right? So when you do actions, which oftentimes, uh, for me at least, consist of disruptions from can, can be low risk to high risk, we make sure to explain beforehand uh, all the risks involved. If there's someone with like a sensitive history, 
they can come and reach out to us, and oftentimes that happens in private because they don't want to, you know, necessarily disclose all the sensitive information. But go talk to them, you know. If they face arrest, however, if they want to face arrest, then so be it, you know, because getting arrested can feel empowering for minorities as long as it is on their terms, though. You know, like like this the the example of St. Patrick's, I, it wasn't on my terms. I wasn't expecting to be, you know, put in handcuffs. So. Get to know a community, I can't stress that enough. That's always very good. But then don't tokenize people, right? So activists have oftentimes like praised me and my bravery, quote unquote, you know, for doing high impact actions in order to convince other people to take risks. You know, tons of Facebook status going on like when, you know, when we were uh, sharing the video. You know, did you know that Rafaela can be deported if she, she gets arrested, but she still puts herself out there, you know? So like, what's your excuse? You know, but, but these people that were, were saying those things never really even take the time to understand the complexities of what it is like to be an immigrant in the United States. You know, so not asking that much. So get to know that too. Don't tokenize people. Create a, a buddy system. So continuing on, on the pre-talk action, we always encourage activists to look out for each other, uh, especially for minorities who may be singled out by the police. We call it a buddy system and it stress the importance of not leaving um, activists in need alone. And we also always have designated people who are in charge of talking to the police and normally those people are white men, if possible, you know, because they hold more privilege. Jail support is really, really important. So first make sure everyone has a, uh, your lawyer's information. And if you don't have a lawyer, highly recommend that you get yourself one, like a pro bono you know, good soul that would be willing to, to give you free advice and collect your activist emergencies contacts and let, uh, ask them if they have any health issues. You know, for example, if an activist needs to take insulin, you know, that can be a life-threatening thing that you should be aware of. Or if they have any animals in the house that need to be fed or children. Those are all important information that you need to know in advance so you can better help your activists. Uh, number three. Oh, okay, that was it. And if you'd like to know, yeah, if you'd like to know more um, about this more in depth, because I'm just like trying to cover the bulk of it, not going too much into detail, uh, I wrote an article called um, Direct Actions for the Privileged, and the one about uh, immigration is fighting for animal liberation while operating in a production line, how the privileged trigger trauma and dehumanize immigrants. Long title, but I think it's worth reading, so. Let's move to part two, the lack of pro-intersectionality. Pro so I came across this book, which is called When We Fight, We Win, which talks about how the new wave of social, social justice movements is taking a more pro-intersectional approach, right? Uh, that's not to say that every LGBTQ rights you know, group out there is now considering issues of you know, racism or ableism or ageism, and they're surely not of animal rights, but you know, other movements currently have a greater advantage when it comes to advocating for multiple forms of oppression, building bridges, and, in, and standing solidarity with other movements, which we currently are lacking off in the animal rights movement. Right? So why is, it, why is it important to include other struggles in our fight? First, because it is the right thing to do. Simple. My new phrase is like, it's not either or, it's both and. So rather than minimizing oppressions, we should be highlighting them. You know, be there for other causes. Pour our hearts because you care, not because you're expecting some sort of like immediate return from it. Trying to dismantle multiple issues doesn't mean you're not doing justice to whatever your main cause may be, right? It means you're actually being very strategic about how to dismantle it. People, you know, usually vegans, uh, oftentimes criticize the work we do uh, by saying that we're not, you know, doing justice to, to animals, that it's just like too much information to give, that it's too complicated, people won't get it, right? And most, look, most vegans want to convince people, right, that animals, um, violence is wrong. So what we do at Collectively Free is not only appealing to other struggles that humans can identify with, so we're actually boosting our chances of connecting the dots. We're trying to convince humans that animal liberation is important. And how do we expect to do that if we keep alienating minorities, right? How do we expect to do that? So we want not only to have more animal rights activists, we want to have better activists as a whole. I know, it sounds like a lot. It's possible. 
Number two, because it helps animals. You know? So a very simple way of explaining this is I'm going to call Ria Carey, who is the executive director of the National LGBTQ Task Force, the best quote ever. Leadership for me is tied to this question of vision and a desire for wholeness. We can't ask someone to be an undocumented immigrant one day, a lesbian the next, and a mom the third, third day. Our vision is about transforming society so that she can be all those things every single day and that there will be a connectedness among social justice workers and among the organizations and agendas, if you will, to make her life whole. So, you know, Rhea understands that the only way she will be able to completely smash homophobia and transphobia is also by attacking the relationships that make homophobia and transphobia strong. She understands that questions like gender, like immigration status and class and so many other issues make homophobia and transphobia thrive. And we can also ask that from non-human animals because they're not sta statics. We are fooling ourselves if we think speciesism is the only discrimination that animals face. Non-human animals do face discrimination, for example, based on their sexual orientation. I mean, if you were, again, Christopher Sebastian's talk about queering, you probably you know, learned a lot about that. Um, if people remember the case of Benji, the gay bull, you know, um, he was going to be murdered earlier specifically because of his sexual orientation because a gay animal is considered of no value to the animal agriculture industry, right? So how about age? You know, we can talk also too. Think about how animals get murdered when they're babies because young flesh is marketed as tender and juicy, you know, whereas an older flesh would be seen as tough and chewy. So these are just two examples. We have to amplify animals' voices in many of the struggles that they face. And when we think about animal agriculture, we also have to realize that it is an exploitative industry that profits not just from the bodies of animals. It profits from the bodies and the legal status of undocumented people or people with legal history. You know, in fact, the industry in the United States could not operate if it wasn't for the exploitation of undocumented immigrants. Immigrants who are often times escaping from, um, from poverty and from violence only to face perhaps uh, a little less poverty and a different kind of violence, right? So the industry also profits from financially insecure communities that don't have the political power to demand that farms and slaughterhouses not be uh, built near their homes. So if we all want to be effective, effective in abolishing animal agriculture, we need not only to be addressing the rights of non-humans, but we also think of how we can support the efforts of immigrants and low-income low people. And two books I read to learn a lot about this. Oh, I didn't put them there, I'm sorry. It's called Every 12 Seconds, who is an amazing book about slaughterhouse workers, and The Right to Stay Home, which talks about immigrants, uh, sp uh, precisely Mex the Mexican migration to the United States and focuses on animal agriculture. And of course, all of this is not an easy task, right? Because every, ev so here's just an example of how like all these forms of oppression come together to, you know, we can help dismantle them to get them to, to animal liberation. And of course, that's not an easy task, right? Because, oh, there it is, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just nervous right now. So this, this is the, the book, Every 12 Seconds and the Right to Stay Home by David Bacon. You should check it out. Of course, that's not an easy task, so every group who has ever decided to care about the bigger picture always faces, always faces pushbacks. So Rhea Carey described this when the National LGBTQ Task Force decided to publicly support immigration rights. Their Facebook was flooded with LGBTQ people saying, so are you going to support those people now? Meaning the immigrants. Right? Or the Dreamers movement, I don't know if you folks are familiar with them, but they are an immigration movement in the United States who actually forced two of their organizers to remain in the closet saying that adding queer issues to the fight of immigration would only complicate things. But you know, those two groups came around and the evidence has shown that it has only made both groups stronger to include other struggles and to be unapologetic about it. So what can our movement do to start advocating a little bit more uh, holistic? So look at the roots, right? Learn what intersection, <laughs> I know. <it's laughs> learn, learn what intersectionality is and what 
it isn't. I, find, I actually find it very helpful to learn what, what it isn't as well, right? Intersectionality was an invention of that guy or that other guy over there, right? Uh, it was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. And other very important names that, to remember, I want to talk about Sojourner Tr Truth and Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks and Angela Davis, among many other thinkers. Um, critical thinkers that I look up to are, you know, in this conference, Unfortunately, Afco couldn't make it, but Dr. Brees Harper, Christopher Sebastian, Kim Socha, Patrice Jones are among the, the people that I really look, to, look, look up to and have learned a lot from. But not only that, right? I think that for all of us, um, what it takes to understand speciesism and other forms of oppression is really to look in the mirror. Speciesism, as it stands today, is undoubtedly a result of white supremacy which intensifies itself with anthropocentrism, but a very particular kind, right? Where the white cis hetero man is at the center of everything. So literally, one status of humanity depends on all of those factors, and the more you are away from that, the less human you, be you become, as, you know, Silco so brilliantly points out. And if you don't know, and if you don't know Silco and the work that AFCO do, please get to know them. They're like revolutionary in the animal rights movement right now. So I'm going to quote her. Uh, their white notion of what the animal constructed, uh, const construed under the white supremacist framework as subhuman, non-human, or inhuman is the conceptual vehicle for justified violence. You know, so the more you are away from that center over there, the less human basically you become. So, you know, um, let me tell you a little story about basically growing up in Brazil, right? And what I learned from the history books. So I learned that Brazil was discovered. I swear, everywhere. Brazil was discovered. And that Cabral, who was this white colonizer, brought great development to my country, right? What we didn't learn was that Cabral was basically a white, a white terrorist, right? Uh, terrorists like him committed genocide against natives, and they brought oppressions like sexism, racism, and homophobia. Yeah, it, it actually wasn't until the colonizers came that homophobia became a crime, right? So these are the things that we never talk about in those books. And while we're talking about LGBTQ um, issues, check out what Christopher Patterson points out. Uh, he says that the association with animality and sexuality can be traced as far as Cicero, who argued in his moral obligations, portraying homosexuality as bestial acts allow the homophobic to deny the animality present in all sexuality. So, you know, you see sort of like a pattern happening here? And in addition, you know, white terrorists also brought greed and commodification of everything and everyone. If you think about gold, uh, silver, and copper who were extra extracted by slave labor and were sent to Europe. And um, anyone want to guess when was the first record of farm animals being brought to Brazil? During the colonization period. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And you knew it. Um, it was, <laughs> I didn't know this until just kind of recently, actually, just doing research, right? They, they, um, they asked for, for, first they just brought a few animals, right? And then they realized they could get a lot of, uh, of things from animals and make a profit off them. So they required a whole ship called Galga just to bring cows. And just like that, all the cows brought. That's pretty much um, the, I would say, the you know, initial of capitalism and animal agriculture, that, uh, at least the culture of it, you know, that you can profit in massive scale from, from animals, and that's pretty much the capitalist culture, right? And also, according to many sources, from what I research, you know, intensive factory farming, some people say it started in the U.S., some people say it started in the U.K. I think people fight over it. Um, that's, that's what my research you know, showed. So let's not forget basically who the root oppressors are. And I don't say this in like a condescending way, like I'm removing myself from it just because I unpacked all this shit, right? No, I'm saying this as a person who still gets a lot of privilege from, from being white and still does a lot of unpacking every day. So I'm not removing myself from it. You know, I'm just asking more people to join in this unpacking you know, process, which is a thing that you should do pretty much every day, right?
So let's time also take time to educate ourselves on history that is not whitewashed. I know it's hard to find materials out there, but you know you can. So you can also better fight for non-human animals. Join a community, you know? So the thing with pro-intersectionality is like, when you think you've learned it, you realize you haven't. You know, so days I'm like, I think I got this, and then it's like, it was like totally the opposite of it, right? So I joined, you know, a few Facebook groups like Disrupt Racism, Disrupt Xenophobia, Disrupt Ageism. There's a few, whole bunch of them so that you could join in to learn more things. And the one I just recently found out that's really, really good is called Anti-Racist and Intersectional Vegans Against Mainstream Vegan Ideology. Uh, that one's really good. It's currently only available in English, so if, you know, English might not be your, your primary language, I'm sure you could find some other um, groups that would do that. Um, create activism that reflect common goals or struggles. So the topic on how to cre create a campaign that effectively reflect common goals is a long, long topic, so I'm just gonna focus a little bit on a few of our campaigns and give us a few examples of what, of what not to do. Right? So what we do collectively free is literally, literally fry our brains to come up with campaigns and actions and community building events that can bring the animal rights movement one step closer to becoming that, like the new uh, social justice movements that we talk, the new wave, I'm sorry, of new social justice movements we talked about earlier. So the challenge is that there is a lot of great theory out there, right? But a lot of which it can be a little inaccessible, can be a little too long, or it can be sometimes too academic. You know, so it's hard. our goal as activists is trying to transform big ideas that make completely sense on theory into actually actions, like groundwork, grassroots actions, and three bite-sized three-word posters, you know? Let's start with what not to do, what I think. And I, I, I'm gonna say this in advance, I don't, I'm sure that a lot of the, the, the slides I'm gonna show of not, not to do, I'm sure all these people, I'm not saying these people are bad or anything like that, I'm just saying that perhaps the tactics are not the most effective, okay? So here it goes, PETA, and I'm sorry, this is like some triggering stuff in here too, right? So, you know, dressing up as KKK members to talk about the breeding of dogs, I wouldn't say that's like pro-intersectional, right? Um, 269, repeatedly staging violence against women, be it in the form of branding or sexual assault. Also, I don't think that's very pro-intersectional and not acknowledging how branding has been used by white supremacists too, um, not pro-intersectional. Pete again, um, pitting direct action everywhere, packed human meat, so sexualizing and commodifying women's body without you know, giving, I think this, there, the, I actually think there's a way of making this, this campaign pretty successful if you were addressing how both women and animals' bodies are sex sexualized, but that's not the goal of either of these campaigns. So I actually think each of these campaigns could have been done, you know, very effectively. And surprise, ta-da, that's my group. Collectively free, milk is rape, that's not pro-intersectional at all. So, you know, using triggering oppressions to further, further another oppression, not pro-intersectional, you know? So, my group, when we first started two, two years ago, I think, yeah, this was like one of the first <laughs> posters we had, you know? So, it's like living and learning and owing up for your fucked up mistakes and changing things when you have to and, you know, just being public about it and apologizing and being better. So I'm not immune to any criticism whatsoever, right? So if we can avoid doing all of this, why wouldn't we, right? Why, why do we always want to get the shortcut? So a, a few examples though, I wanna talk about what I think we have effectively done is the Starbucks campaign. So we started um, our campaign by screening a documentary called Black Gold, which tell the stories of coffee farmers in Ethiopia, which is the largest coffee exporter in the world. And as you can imagine, you know, Starbucks is ranked as one of the main contributors of their poverty. And we also personally invited Starbucks employees to come. And at the end of the Q&A, we linked issues of racism, colonialism, and of course, animal rights, since Starbucks is actually more of a milk company than they are a coffee company. And since then, we mobilized several actions around the world, highlighting multiple oppressions. And we also have a petition online. Um, if you are interested, you can go at collectivelyfree.org to sign. And it goes without saying that for every campaign, we also do a big push for social media with memes, videos, and always explaining 
you know, uh, qu the questions of how racism came to play into business and profit at Starbucks. Chocolate campaign. Uh, for a chocolate campaign, we called Attention to Child Slavery and released a blog, blog post by our brilliant Toronto organizer called Tori Lyon. It's a, it's a really good blog post. She connected very well in deep issues of racism, colonialism, capitalism, even heterosexism. I don't know how she did that, but it was really good. And animal rights. And the blog post got picked up by other groups in other social justice circles, like groups that are not animal rights related at all, and also was shared by this page called Slave Free Chocolate, which is not a vegan uh, page. And we also directed a link to the Food Empowerment Project because they talk a lot about uh, chocolate and they are amazing. I'm sure you've, oh, uh, Lauren was just talking in here about it, so there we go. We also did a campaign against Chick-fil-A, which is a company which obviously pro uh, profits from the bodies of chickens, but they're also publicly homophobic, right? And they go as far as financing anti-LGBTQ groups. So we staged a kissing, do I have a photo of that? Yeah, that's my wife and I. So we staged a kissing on their grand opening in New York and got tons of, of positive media attention. Thank you, all the gays. Get the love from the gays, woo! Yeah, I'm pretty proud to say those, you know, those were like really good. It was the, one of those rare times where actually the media reported exactly as we wanted, you know, cause I was like, please don't just say we're like LGBTQ related, make sure you put animals. And then for the other person I had to be like, please don't put just animals, make sure you put LGBTQ, okay? Like, <laughs> and they did. So that was like a rare, rare moment. Um, our latest one was at the New York State Fraternal Order of Police. So the police organized a pig roast to raise money for their fraternal order just, out, order, just outside of New York. And the act of eating an entire pig is used to mock their own corruption since cops are quite often referred to as pigs. I don't know if it's the same in here, but in the US, yeah. Is it the same in here? Yeah, okay. So this was a perfect opportunity to speak about police brutality and speciesism. So reach, we reached out to different groups that we're in touch with, like Black Lives Matter New York, NYC Shut It Down, and several other ones. And actually I was kind of like shaking by it, but Black Lives Matter New York organizer, uh, Autumn Marie, actually wrote to us and said this was like a fantastic action. So I was like, oh, wow, that's like badass. Um, despite the fact that we didn't get the numbers that we wanted, I still consider it to be like a success because we addressed two important issues that are quite often overlooked in, when they're talked about together, right? And also because the cops need to know that they won't get any peace until we get justice. Fuck yeah. <laughs> can, you, can, you hold, can you hold for a Q&A? Because I have to blast it through. What is that? Yes, they do. Can we get a q and I'm sorry, I'm like, already, I started like 10 minutes after, so I wanna make sure, I'm, I'm still in part two. Black, Black Lives Matter, absolutely. Other initiatives, we also do blog posts and various social media engagements. So for this year, we put our first CF United uh, event, uh, which were three days of talks, actions, and community building. So that's Alton Marie here from Black Lives Matter, and um, Ida Hammer, who's a, a, a trans activist. And you know, we, on top of doing uh, this three-day event, we also gave free housing, one free meal a day, and um, a free and accessible venue for activists to come. So part three, let's do a recap. Part three, I'm gonna get into building bridges, why building bridges is so important. But just let's do a recap. So far we understand that speciesism is not the only layer which we need to fight against, against to dismantle the industry. We understand the just urgency and vital need to include other struggles because one is the right thing to do and it also relates to life and death situations of our own activists, right? Our own community members. Non-animals are not monolithic and they face all sorts of oppression that stem from white supremacy and anthropocentrism. We got that right, okay. So I want to bring one of my favorite current movements that is Black Lives Matter because I think they can teach us a lot. So BML at its core is a queer and feminist movement and it has made very clear that it won't tolerate being anything less than that. 
And BML has a strong supporters of Palestine and has recently announced its endorsement to BDS. B BML has connected immigration issues, has showed up for native rights in Dakota, and has even marched when a white man was victim of police brutality. Right? In addition, just recently, the Chicago chapter threw an all-vegan event, and yeah, there are tons of uh, Black Lives Matter folks who are actually vegan, and I mean, organizers, so I think if there's one group that's currently doing justice to the All Lives Matter hashtag, it's not the animal rights movement, that's Black Lives Matter, so we have to stop using that damn hashtag. Um, <laughs> so annoying. So has anyone in here ever been actively, um, you know, part of any non-AR groups or actions? You? That's, that's good, awesome, okay. So, you know, for the rest who, who haven't yet done it, right? So how do we expect to build bridges if we're not willing to put our bodies on the line for minorities, and if we don't advocate holistically, and if we keep replicating violence in our campaigns, right? So for one example, uh, we did, uh, I think I missed that, the PPA. Okay, I, I can talk about, about the PPA. Uh, one of the things we did is we did open meetings. Uh, we, we did an open meeting with the Stop Mass Incarceration Network, which is obviously a group that talks about mass incarceration. And one of the lines that this person, um, this activist told us is she said, she believed that this woman was a true ally when she jumped in front of a cop to take the hit, and that was a white woman. And so I'm asking you to like, put your body out there and take the, take the hit, right? Show up to other movements, open meetings, and actions. So, you know, we, we are, I'm kind of like strategic about what to say and what not to say uh, in these this spaces. You know, I don't think every opportunity to talk about animal rights has to be an opportunity. Sometimes you just have to stay there and listen, you know? Like, don't go into other people's spaces just expecting to have that one time where you're gonna talk about animal rights, you know? Like, sometimes you just have to go be there and listen to it, right? So one good, like, like I said, don't talk as if the space is, is yours, you know, and don't occupy more space than you need to, to occupy. Um, we also, you know, create sort of like easy to access materials. So our website and Facebook can relate common goals. Uh, and when folks investigate who we are, they will see the contact they can relate to. So just recently I, I was talking to another a uh, student's group that also does uh, stop mass incarceration uh, actions, and I'm trying to build bridges with them, right? So the first thing they ask me is like, can you tell me more about what Collectively Free does, and can you talk about how mass incarceration, what does mass incarceration have anything to do with animal rights, right? So then I start talking to her, and then the second thing she told me is like, you are probably aware that, you know, black people are, uh, has been, have been um, dehumanized and compared to, to animals historically, historically for all this fact. So you may know why we're weary of, you know, building bridges with animal rights people, right? So, you know, like, we, we've kind of created this, so it's up to us to be there and, you know, create those bridges and, and, and talk to them and, you know, show what you got, show that you're willing to, to, create, the, to create those bridges and that you're not like PETA. I hope you're not, you know? <laughs> so yeah, this is a, a picture we did with the Stop Mass Incarceration group. It was just like such a civil, it was like an awesome discussion, you know? They came and presented what they did as far as like actions, and then we did a mini talk about what we did, and then in the end we were like, okay, how can we work together? You know, but like not how can we work together, are you gonna be vegan, but like how can we seriously work together? You know, how can I get my activists to come to yours? And you know, animal rights people were exposed about the system prison in the US that they had never been exposed or even thought about reading. You know, so it's about making those activists like better folks, right? So in the end, act. So create those actions that reflect common goals and invite other groups to come. Needless to say, keep showing up to other groups, groups, right? So to conclude, could it be that the system really wants animal rights activists to focus only on fighting spe speciesism without acknowledging the fact that the same system treating non-human animals as expendable is the same system saying, make America great again? pushing for deportation of immigrants, shooting people of color, controlling women's bodies, killing LGBTQ people, and treating disabled folks a lesser than? I'm not asking you that you drop whatever you're doing or drop your own group, you know, and just, you know, become a human rights activist. That's not 
what I'm asking. But as activists, we shouldn't, we shouldn't attempt to dismantle all forms of oppression either because that, that would simply be unrealistic and like too much to do in one lifetime, right? But it's, it's perfectly fine to have a focus, but it's also crucial that we remain supportive and, even, and inclusive of other social justice causes. So I would like to share a video of the Fraternal Order of Police Big Rose just to show you what it looks like in an action, right? Because that was just a lot of talk and you're probably wondering, okay, that was a lot of talk, but how do you do it, right? So let's see if, uh, if the video is gonna work now. Black lives, they matter here. Black lives, they matter here. Queer lives, they matter here. Queer lives, they matter here. Native lives, they matter here. Native lives, they matter here. Pig lives, they matter here. Pig lives, they matter here. Systems of oppression are, are not isolated. They're, they're intertwined. And it's not because this group over here experiences this kind of brutality, and this group over here experiences a similar brutality, so they're alike. It's because those issues stem from the same mentality. The mentality that there is a dominant group of people. Right, so here we are today, trying to dismantle different portions of white supremacy through police brutality. I'm tired of seeing story after story, video after video of police harassing and killing people because of the color of their skin, because of their race. Story after story of women who were forced into sexual acts by the police because the police knew they had the power and that the women could not speak up against them. Tired of seeing all the sexual violence endured not just by women, but queer and trans folks across this country, across this city. And here they are too, turning the tables on pigs, treating them as the perpetrators of violence, when in fact they are the victims of systemic violence too. And let's not forget the thousands of animals that the police force use to enforce violence and xenophobia. Animals like dogs and horses who don't have a choice. And to see this event that just epitomizes it all. Police taking an innocent victim, a probably six month old baby pig, and not just killing that pig, but having an entire event to celebrate eating her body. So we're out here today and I thank you for coming to what I think is a very powerful statement. We're out here protesting racism and speciesism, but no, at the core, at the core, we're really fighting all systems of oppression. So that's what we did, and you know, we got, we shared it in a whole bunch of groups, and it got picked up and liked by all the, the other social justice movements. We didn't get any negative comments. I don't know if people didn't want to comment or not, but I consider that to be a pretty good thing. So it's like exposing, you know, the f animal rights issue and how that can be combined with other forms of oppression as well. So I hope, you know, I, I inspired you all to, to try to do that with your own activism, to attending more other causes, other social justice movements, to showing up and to being active for other causes as well. Thank you. So I guess we don't have time for Q&A, but if you have any questions, uh, I'm gonna be just outside over here and I'm happy to talk to you about it. Hi guys, yeah, don't go yet, don't go yet. I love to have the loudest auditorium and this beautiful lady has spoken with love and passion and I know I only caught bits of it, but I do know her work. Please, can we really give a lovely VegFest appreciation, round of applause. <laughs> 